follow the schedule. Yeah, today we're extremely happy to have a Peter Armitage uh, giving a talk on the uh, bound dependent interaction of a cobalt based uh, magnet. So, so Peter is actually very well known in the community. You know, he did his PhD with uh, ZX Chen at uh, Stanford, initially doing ARPAS on electron doped cupers. So I know Peter's work for many, many, many years. <laughs> and, and he has, you know, summarized all his work in a very, very nice review modern physics paper and other people's work as well on electron doped cupers. And after that, uh, you know, he's most recently not, does not do ARPAS, doing many of the other sort of light spectroscopy and, and so on and so forth, and really made a name for, for himself. And he has another review modern physics paper that's actually extremely, you know, well-cited on, on, uh, on, on this sort of a, a subject. Yeah, today, so we're, we're happy to have him uh, giving a, a talk on the bound dependent, you know, sort of cotype type of interaction in, in the, the cobalt honeycomb analysis systems. And, and sort of a, a companion talk, as so Collins, uh, sort of neutron you know, scattering talk that was given a couple of weeks earlier. Yeah, it's all yours, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. And you're you're seeing my uh, my main slides, right? Not yeah, the preview. Yeah, it's, it's very it's very clear. Yeah. Great. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah. So, of course, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be to be here virtually. And uh, thanks very much, uh, Penching, for the uh, for the invitation. Indeed, we've. Um, Talking physics for uh, for well over uh, twenty years now and uh, ongoing still. So um, yeah, so the talk today I'm gonna I would talk uh, about a number of different things. Uh, the, the the different aspects are all kind of hung, if you will, on this notion of uh, bond dependent interactions in various insulating magnets, and in particular I'm going to talk about this class of cobalt based magnets and. Uh, give examples of these are insulators with strong magnetic interactions, and I'm going to give uh, 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 two particular material examples of these in the form of chains and honeycombs. Um, I, I think that these are that these are interesting both by themselves and uh, also the connection between them is interesting. Uh, the, the chain compound cobalt niobate is uh, was is still the best material realization we have of an Ising chain, one dimensional Ising chain that one can tune, let's say through a quantum critical point in, in one dimension, the, the Ising chain, let's say tunable with transverse field is uh, a paradigm system for quantum phase transitions. It's probably the simplest model system for fractionalization and, um, uh, and, and is interesting in its own right. But it also turns out that cobalt niobate, uh, as we've shown recently in, in a paper, uh, also has very strong bond dependent interactions, meaning that the, the easing axis, if you will, kind of alternates uh, uh, left, right, left, right, as you go down through the crystal. It was initially just thought that it was going to be a straight uh, ising like interaction, say, uh, oriented along some global Z direction. And we find out that the situation is, is more interesting. Uh, more complicated, but also more interesting. Um, that's going to uh, lead us uh, into the study of a two-dimensional version of that, which is a honeycomb lattice. Uh, we'll 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 see that. I'll, I'll point out the connection with that and honeycomb lattices with strong bond-dependent interactions. The so-called Kitai of interaction has this thought to be a um, uh, a possible realization of a, a possible material realizations of of a quantum spin liquid state. So so those are all the things that we're going to talk about. Okay, um, before I uh, get into that, let me uh, thank the various people who have made the work possible. My, uh, my former postdoc, uh, Chris Morris. Let's see, I'm trying to show this. Uh, excuse me. Not getting my. Um, need to show the. For some reason that the. Oh, you're looking for a pointer? Yeah, I'm looking for the pointer, but it where has it gone? The uh, this seems to change all the time with uh, with Zoom. Uh, where's the pointer gone? Let's see. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pointer, pointer, pointer. Well, I don't see the pointer. Um, That's a pity, and I don't see even the arrow on the other screen. Oh, it's a different. Is this a bug or a feature? I think it's a bug. Um, just a second again. Does anybody remember how to make the... Uh... Let's see here. Uh, it should be under... Um... Should be tools, remote control, no? 
Okay, well, uh, I'll just continue onward anyway. Um, if somebody knows how to make the pointer appear, let me know. Yeah, I don't know why. Usually there should be an annotate button as well. Mm -hmm. Very strange, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, we, uh, we won't worry about it. Um, let's go onward. So, um, Okay, so uh, thanking the people that uh, that made this possible, my uh, my former postdoc Chris Morris, who is now unfortunately out of science, but has still been involved with this work until recently, my former student Shinshu Zhang, who is a uh, currently a postdoc in Anshul Kogar's group at UCLA, uh, colleague Tyrell McQueen, longtime collaborator Bob Kava, colleague Sayed Kupaya, colleague Oleg Chernyshev, uh, Bob's former postdoc Rudan Zong, who's uh, who's now in China, my colleague Natalia Drichko and her former student Yuan Wanzhou, uh, my colleague Colin Broholm, his student Tom Halloran, uh, collaborator Thomas Room and his group at the National Institute for Chemical Physical Biophysics in Estonia. Uh, and uh, I would like to in particular uh, thank my, my collaborator Ribu Call in the, the latter part of uh, the talk today, in particular the identification of the bond dependent interactions at cobalt niobate Ni Ni came out of a came out of actually a conversation when I was giving a colloquium. The last colloquium I actually gave before uh, everything shut down in 2020 was uh, my last talk of the day. Last meeting of the day was with Ribu, and you know basically in a half hour we we figured out a, a bunch of stuff that we had previously not understood. Okay, so uh, I'll give you my conclusions in the beginning. So uh, I'll tell you about uh, this, this on this general topic of uh, bond-dependent interactions in, in cobalt-based uh, magnets. Uh, I'll tell you about cobalt niobate, which is uh, thought to be the best material realization of Easing's model. Uh, a little bit of a review of, of old results. Uh, I think these are still beautiful, and it's uh, important with our new understanding to put those results in, in context. So tell you a little bit about the kinds of bound states that you can find in such a system. And then something about the new results. So uh, indeed, we can think of this system as an Ising chain in, in large enough transverse magnetic field. This is uh, Ising chain, a ferro Ising chain in transverse magnetic field is the simplest example we have of a quantum phase transition. And uh, quantum phase transitions, phase transitions in general actually are can be characterized by duality relations and a particularly beautiful and simple duality relation where there's a universal factor of two that can be found, the so-called the Kramers Vanier duality can be pointed out. From that, we can learn that this material system hosts strong bond-dependent interactions, and we call the model that describes this the twisted Kitayev chain, and among other aspects, this has the interesting feature that this is uh, mappable to the, the the resulting model is mappable to the Sushri for Heger model of of poly that's uh, the simplest model for polyacetylene and a version of a one-dimensional topological insulator. Then I'll tell you about bond-dependent interactions in uh, in two D magnets and uh, their presence or lack thereof in this material barium cobalt arsenic, and tell you a little bit about the work that's ongoing there. So uh, my assumption is that this is a this is a broad audience uh, uh, and not all specialists. So I'll start off with a little bit of preparation and background. And the basic idea here is that for over thirty years there has been searches for quantum spin liquid states in various kinds of frustrated magnets. And the basic idea is, is that if I have, let's say an essential anti-ferromagnetic interaction, and I have spins on a lattice that has a triangular motif, then putting two spins down anti-aligned to each other, a third spin can't figure out which way to go. Um, this frustration uh, can, can manifest itself in a number of different ways. But one thing that one is perhaps looking at very often is that there is no magnetically ordered state down to temperatures, which are very, very, very small, perhaps much smaller than the intrinsic scale of the exchange interactions, much smaller than the J that uh, would, would set the interaction scale between two spins. Then here one can have a, a variety of different possibilities, but one possibility is that uh, you could imagine a triangular lattice uh, ultimately satisfies this tendency to anti-align spins by forming singlet states. And so this would be every two spins in, that are joining in this lattice. One possibility is that they would form a singlet state, which is a superposition of spin up with spin down. And then the true ground state of the system would be found as the, the, the macroscopic uh, massive superposition of all possible ways that you might tile the triangular lattice with these singlets. So this has been the traditional way that uh, that, that spin liquids have been looking for, typically systems based on triangular motif. 
Um, now in 2006, uh, there was a milestone in quantum spin liquid physics, and that was the proposal by Alexei Kitayev of now what we call this Kitayev model, which was an exactly solvable model. And the Kitayev model consists of spin one half spins on a two-dimensional honeycomb lattice with bond-dependent easing interactions. And uh, you can this is the, the Kitayev uh, Hamiltonian that's shown here on the right side of my plot. And the basic idea is that uh, if one considers that uh, for every spin, there are three directions that along, let's say the green bonds, it's the X, uh, the X components of the spin, which interact and along the blue bonds, it's the Y components of the spin and along the red bonds, it is the Z component of the spin. So this is a different route to frustration. The hexagonal lattice by itself is not particularly frustrated, but this uh, bomb dependent interactions on the lattice, on a lattice like such would lead to a frustrated state because you can't uh, satisfy all of the, the, the constraints, if you will, by, by classical spins. And what Kitayev showed was that through an ingenious substitution in terms of Majorana Majorana fermions, the system was a spin liquid described by this Hamiltonian, and it was exactly solvable. You could find the wave functions and the and the uh, spectrum exactly. Now, um, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, that uh, that this uh, exactly solvable Kitayev model was was considered to be rather unrealistic at the time. But it's also fair to say that in, in say building up theoretical descriptions descriptions of many body systems, very frequently exactly solvable models are are important despite their their often artificiality because they can establish the point of principle that a particular phase of matter can exist. And so in this particular case, among other aspects, this demonstrates that there's no, let's say, physical principle that excludes a quantum spin liquid. But I think it's fair to say that people thought that this particular interaction was, was unlikely. Um, it was uh, another milestone in this physics is uh, the Jekyll and Kalulin had demonstrated that you could get, uh, it was natural, if you will, to have strong Ising exchange anisotropy in a plane that would be perpendicular to edge sharing octahedra. And so if we can imagine edge sharing octahedra, say some transition metal with oxygens around it in the octahedral geometry, edge sharing octahedra realize hex hexagons. And it's very natural in systems which have strong spin orbit coupling than to have strong bond dependent interactions. The, uh, they proposed, they and other proposed uh, iridate systems and uh, as a possible realization of that and subsequent to that, uh, various ruthenates like the famous alpha ruthenium chloride have been proposed. These have been typically these D5, um, uh, D5 ions, which uh, with strong spin orbit clumping, the iridates, the ruthenates. Uh, many of these systems, uh, despite the fact that they do show evidence for Kitayev interaction, this bond-dependent interaction, they ultimately do still order at the lowest temperatures. And there may be some possibilities for suppressing the effects of the other interactions that are coming in that are not just the Kitayev interaction. And that's been a major focus in this field is looking for material systems which may have this strong Kitayev interaction, but at the same time, will have uh, 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 the other terms which are symmetry allowed, but maybe small. And so uh, the, in alpha ruthenium chloride, it's believed that uh, uh, been proposed that you can reach some kind of quantum spin liquid state by applying an in-plane field of something of order seven or eight Tesla uh, to reach the similar kind of quantum spin liquid state for applying an out-of-plane field it's believed you have to go to something like 80 Tesla. And it's not really possible to do real spectroscopies and certainly not neutron scattering at 80 Tesla at this point. So one would be interested in then looking for material systems where these other terms you have here, the, the first term in this Hamiltonian expression that I've written down is the Kitayev term, but then you have Heisenberg terms and these various other off-diagonal exchanges, the, the gamma, the gamma prime term, as well as possibly J3 term, which is uh, the next, next nearest neighbor interactions. Okay. So we're looking for systems that possibly have smaller ones. Then in this regard, it was proposed that uh, one might have uh, this realized in the D7 cobalt compounds. I want to get into the details of this, but this was proposed also by, this was by, by Sato and uh, by Lu and Kalulin. And what they had predicted was that in the D7 compounds, again, split by the octahedral field, is that 
One, you might show, you can show that you have uh, a combination of, of spin orbit coupling and crystal field splittings give you an L equals one orbital. And then the this uh, high spin configuration of S equals three halves combined together with spin orbit coupling to give you this lowest, give you a lowest Cramer's doublet, which uh, is an effective pseudo spin one half. Complicated wave functions as I've written down right here, but nevertheless, the proposal was, and uh, their calculations suggested, was that systems like this should have very strong Kitai of interaction, where what is uh, typically the case that uh, you have, uh, uh, let's say, a ferro contribution from the EG and an anti-ferro contribution to exchange that's coming from T2G, that these would compensate each other in the D7 compounds, which have both, and this may get smaller uh, isotropic Heisenberg exchange A, and then, for instance, might manifest itself with smaller critical fields. Okay, so so this is what the talk is, uh, one of the things that the talk is about today, and it's uh, going to be the, the hunt for compounds, if you will, with strong bond-dependent interactions in this D7 materials, right? So cobalt in the hexagonal lattice. So I'm going to come back to this, and I'm going to come back to this particularly in the context of hexagonal lattices, but I'm going to come there in a if you will, kind of a roundabout fashion. Uh, I'm going to come there from the, the fashion of uh, what, what you might think initially to be a seemingly only peripherally related topic, and that is of the, of the Ising chain, in particular Ising chain that we might be able to tune with transverse magnetic field. And I assure you that these, these topics in the end are related. Okay, so uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, quantum phase transitions are, uh, are, of course, an important topic in, in modern condensed matter physics. Cooperate materials, heavy fermion compounds, uh, all of these are thought uh, the, they may derive their unusual physics from proximity to a quantum phase transition, which is a, uh, a change of the ground state as a function of some non-thermal parameter. Quantum phase transitions in general are characterized by a, by a collapse of energy scales. So typically we'll imagine some physical system which has, let's say, a gap to the lowest excited state from the ground state. <laughs> and by changing some parameter, that could be a magnetic field, but it could be pressure, it could be doping, we have a collapse of energy scales. And uh, that's what we're going to see in uh, this particular case as well. Um, quantum phase transitions and, and phase transitions in general uh, are also characterized by duality relations, where uh, a description of the system on one side of the transition allows itself with some kind of uh, appropriate variable transformation to a description of the other side, the transition. And that's going to be the true here as well. So um, it can also be the case that the character of excitations can be very different on the two sides of the transition. Um, in, in the case of uh, the Ising chain in transverse field, there's a so-called kramers vanier duality that, that relates the excitations on the ferromagnetic side of the transition, which are domain walls, to spin flips, which are the transitions on the other side. And so we'll come back to this in, in a little bit, but this just gives you a feeling for the, the direction we're going. Now, um, it was pointed out some years ago by Radu Koldea that this material, cobalt niobate, also called columbite, is uh, perhaps the best material realization of, of, uh, of, a, of an Ising chain. And so this material, the cobalt spins, uh, in, arranged in this kind of a zigzag uh, pattern here through edge sharing octahedra. You take the system, you cool it down to low temperatures and uh, plot it on the right here as a plot of the heat capacity as a function of temperature. Cobalt niobate, along with a with a uh, non-magnetic analog, which is zinc niobate. And you can see at around 20 Kelvin, these two heat capacities start to differ from each other. And that's where very long one-dimensional correlations start to build up between chains. So you get this uh, this is some older uh, older work from that dates from the 90s, but uh, it was shown that uh, you cool the system down and then you get these two phase transitions. And just before you get the upper phase transition, the correlation length along the chains is something like 100 lattice constants. So before the system orders, it's almost a ferromagnetic chain, but not quite, 100 lattice constants. And then bunk, bunk, there are two transitions to an incommensurate and then commensurate ordered state. Uh, where you get these ferromagnetic chains, which are anti-ferromagnetically coupled to their neighbors, right? And so that's kind of uh, shown here on the left side as a uh, as kind of a cartoon, if you will, 
Um, we consider that the elementary excitations of the system are domain walls between Faro chains. And uh, one of the interesting things about this is that the, when the system has these Faro chains, which order anti ferro magnetically with respect to the neighbors, that has the effect in the language of these domain walls of introducing a confining interaction, right? So the, the red spins want to be, uh, so now my pointer is working interestingly again. The red spins want to be um, anti-parallel to the black spins. And so there's a linearly confining interaction between the, uh, the two blue dots, which has come as a result of the interchain interaction. Now, um, most of the uh, experiments that I will tell you about are being done with time domain terahertz spectroscopy. And I don't want to get into the details of how these experiments are done, but um, there is a ultra fast laser, which is shown here in red, propagating around the table. It is incident on a photoconductive switch, which is there, which makes a pulse of approximately one picosecond long radi radiation, electromagnetic field. Uh, the electric field of you know, a few kilovolts, let's say, over a picosecond. Inverse of a picosecond is a terahertz. And so this picosecond long pulse has all of this Fourier content that is down in the terahertz part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The terahertz part of the electromagnetic spectrum was traditionally always a very difficult part of the electromagnetic spectrum to access. Uh, it was difficult to probe in material systems, but now with techniques like time domain terahertz, we can we can do it very well and in, and in many ways, really quite a lot better than you can probe material systems either at higher frequencies or at lower frequencies. Very often when you have a time domain, uh, a time varying electric field, you're gonna be using that electric field to couple to electric dipole degrees of freedom. But with the time varying electric field, you get a time varying magnetic field and that time varying magnetic field allows you to couple to magnetic dipole degrees of freedom. And so if a material is, let's say, electrically uninteresting at low frequencies, and there are interesting magnetic degrees of freedom, then the time varying magnetic field can, can excite them. And what you're essentially doing is a form of kind of high frequency electron spin resonance. And so the quantity that we're gonna plot is a quantity which is proportional to the susceptibility we measure the real and the imaginary parts of the susceptibility. So that's something that <coughs> a neutron scattering experiment or scattering experiment can't. Uh, but we come with a constraint that we can only measure zero momentum, the susceptibility. Often the, uh, a system might have interesting correlations at zero momentum. And in fact, systems like this, which to some extent are ferromagnets do. And so we can find out quite a lot about these systems by just looking at the zero momentum spectrum. And there it is. So this is cobalt myobate taken down to low temperatures. Um, and uh, what you can see here as this is a plot of the absorption as a function of frequency in the terahertz range, uh, which is corresponds to a few milli electron volts. And you recall when I showed those plots of the heat capacity, around 20 Kelvin, the two curves started to separate from each other. And that's what you can see in this plot here, they uh, you can see these magnetic correlations develop. So something around when the curves are you know kind of getting this green brown color, that's when you start to get this two peak spectrum that gains spectral weight, and then you hit go below the magnetic transition, and just boom, all of that sharp spectral, uh, all of this kind of sharp features come out. Right. So we can look at these in more details, and let's there look at just the lowest temperature spectra. This is again a plot of something like the susceptibility as a function of frequency in the terahertz range. And we have a series of peaks here, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, <coughs> all the way up to M9. And then there's some other features here that we referred to as two, in our original paper as 2M1, and then a, a big blob that uh, we have uh, more information about. Let's look at the lowest nine. And there they're plotted. That's energy versus some index, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, all the way up to M9. Uh, you recall that I had said that we can think about the elementary excitations of this state when we have the ferro chains whose excitations are confined by the anti ferro interaction between them. We can think of that as this linearly confining potential. And so we can take such a system and map it to, the, uh, to a, to a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation where we have a kinetic energy term and then a linearly confining potential. This was first worked out in 
1978 in physical review in a physical review D of McCoy and Wu. Um, they were interested in, in uh, these kinds of things. Physical review D is the particle physics journal. And so they were interested in these kinds of things because this linearly confining interaction between the domain walls is kind of some cartoon for the linearly confining interaction for between two quarks in the meson. At any rate, um, what we can do now, energy versus this index, the, the data is there in red and the black dots on top are the model of McCoy and Wu, who wrote this down in 1978. We can fit the whole discrete spectrum on the basis of two free parameters mm. as such. Okay, okay. So, uh, so what else? Well, we have this very rich spectrum. And if you will, one of the things that we can do is uh, uh, behave a little bit like atomic physicists who also have very rich spectra. And what an atomic physicist does when they have some atom or molecule they want to learn about, they do spectroscopy, they have some model for the wave functions, and they can fit their spectra to find out the wave functions. And so we can do a very similar thing right here. Um, on the basis of those fits, this is plots essentially of the wave functions. And here I want to in particular emphasize the plot on the right, which is uh, plots of the wave functions for these different particles, or for these different excitations, M1, M2, M3, all the way up to M9. And the way you should think about the excitations in the system because of the effective transverse terms, which allow domain wall flips, those have the effect of mixing different um, uh, different multiplets of different numbers of spin flips. And so we should think about the excited states here as superpositions of different numbers of spin flips. So M1 is, if you will, on the bottom here, it's a little bit of one spin flip with a little bit more of two, with a little bit less of three, a little bit less of four, and so on. M2 is, let's say, some part of one spin flip, a lot less of two, a real lot less of three, and then on up again. And as you go up to M9, you can see that uh, you kind of get this a bit of a oscillating pattern, which is uh, uh, if you would do this in the real continuum limit, you would see that it resembles the area function solution, which is the solution to the one dimensional Schrodinger equation. Okay. Now, so this was some work that we had done some years ago uh, and uh, it was kind of, you know, I think just beautiful by itself. But there were some things at the time we didn't understand and the resolution of those is going to bear on what we were discussing in the original part of my talk, which is these bond-dependent interactions. So coming back to the notion of quantum phase transitions for a moment, as I mentioned, quantum phase transitions in general are characterized by a collapse of energy scales. <laughs> the simplest model for an Ising model, as I've written there in the upper left-hand corner, we can imagine some term, which is an Ising term, and then a term which will scale like SX, which will be the transverse field term. And this system, very, very simple Hamiltonian, but is characterized by a quantum phase transition. And you can realize why, if I imagine set the transverse field to zero, so G is equal to zero, then I get a twofold degenerate ground state. All the spins can be up or all the spins can be down. If I put a very large transverse field on the system, then I'm going to point all the spins in the direction of the the field is applied, if it's applied in the x direction, and that's going to be a singly degenerate ground state. Then I can't go from twofold degeneracy to single degeneracy without some kind of discontinuity, and that's the quantum phase transition that happens. Now, the other thing I had said was that phase transitions, continuous phase transitions, are very often characterized by duality relations. And so that's the case here as well, where there is a duality relation that relates the energy of the excitations on one side of the transition to the energy of the excitations on the other side of the transition. And so that's what I plotted here. The elementary excitations, and again, I apologize that, well, now the arrow is not working again. The, um, the, uh, the plot in the middle here with those dispersion curves in red, that is a plot of the dispersion, the energy versus momentum relation for the elementary excitations on the ferro side of the transition, which are these domain walls. And you can see it goes like delta equals 2j times 1 minus g. That's the energy for the gap. Okay, That's one of these domain walls. On the quantum disordered side, which is also what we would call the high field side of this transition, which is also called the paramagnetic state, the excitations of the system are just spin flips. Okay? So I take one of these spins and I flip it against the field. And that, you can see, has a very, that's written there in purple, has a very similar form, 2j times 1 minus g. 
Now, one difference between the ferro side and the anti-ferro, uh, the, the ferro side and the paramagnetic side of the transition is that those domain walls are very non-local excitations. In fact, I can't come in with a neutron or a photon and make just one of them. I always have to make two, if you will. I come in and mm -hmm. make a, spin, a particular spin flip and that it corresponds to, let's say, two domain walls. And so quite generally for a system in the Ising universality class, when I would take a system and tune it through the quantum phase transition, I expect this collapse of energy scales. But I expect that the energy scale, if I call it, let's say, the gap to one of these elementary excitations, the domain wall is delta on the ferro side. The actual gap to make one of these is two delta. Whereas on the paramagnetic side, it's only delta. Right? And so this factor of two, the two delta and delta, that's a universal factor of two, which is emblematic of this so-called Kramers Vanier duality, which is uh, which is a uh, a characteristic of, of the Ising universality class. Okay, so uh, let's look at data. So this is a plot on the left of the absorption, the infrared absorption plotted as a function of frequency. Again, you can see in the terahertz range or the milliv range. It looks a little bit different than the other data that I was showing you before <clears throat> because this was taken. We needed for this study very large magnetic fields. And so these experiments were done up to 12 Tesla in Thomas Room's group at, uh, uh, in, uh, at the National Institute for Chemical uh, Physics, Biophysics and, and Physics in Estonia, in Tallinn, Estonia. And the curve that has the zero field applied transverse field is on the bottom here, on the bottom of this plot. And as I apply transverse field, I can see a few things happen. Well, at first there's a little bit of narrowing. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. But the thing that I wanna concentrate on is not the narrowing, but that this low energy feature, which comes down towards zero energy and then comes back up, right? So again, I apologize that the pointer isn't working, but I hope you see that this is with increasing mm -hmm. field running from bottom to the top. So the top is the largest field. There's this feature that comes down towards zero energy and then comes back out. Now, very often in condensed matter physics, people will try to, let's say, infer the existence of a quantum phase transition from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, collapsing some kind of, let's say, resistivity data, take it at zero frequency, or uh, heat capacity data, thermodynamics, or susceptibility uh, as a function of some tuning parameter. And really, when you perform some analysis like that, when you're going through this procedure of trying to get a collapse, a scaling collapse of the data, effectively what you're doing there is you're trying to extract out the energy scale, which collapses near the transition. And so we don't have to do any of that at all. We just see it spectroscopically, how this energy scale collapses as you go to zero, and then it comes back up. Now, plotted on the right-hand side here, in red on the bottom, Again, something funny happens, and we're going to talk about that in a moment for small fields. But as you get close to the critical point, you can see that this energy scale, what I plotted is the lowest energy scale coming down towards the transition at about five and a half Tesla, and then coming back up again. Those dashed lines are two, let's say, guides to the eye where the, the slopes of them differ by this universal factor of two. So that's the universal factor of two for Kramers Vanier duality, if you will. It's, it's due to Kramers Vanier duality and uh, uh, one might also uh, say the, the conservation of domain wall parity, which is just a fancy way of saying when you make a domain wall, you can't make just one. You got to make two or an odd number of them at a time. Okay. So this is as far as I know, it's it's the, the, the measurement of this universal uh, factor of two is the first direct evidence for uh, kramers vanier duality. Okay. So um, now there were a number of other interesting things about this data. And let me look at just the spectrum for a moment here, center on that. There are a number of different things here that that we had this data actually for a very long time. And this is where this conversation with, with uh, Rubu came in that um, I didn't quite understand. Now, there's two things. One, when you put a field on this system, the very first thing that happens is there's kind of, and you can see it for the maybe the lowest field curves, is there's this narrowing of the spectrum the narrowing of the bandwidth for very small magnetic fields. And then after you have large enough field, then there's kind of, then this feature again goes, moves down towards zero. But at first, it's actually the case that the spectra, the lowest energy feature actually moves up. And that's just completely at odds with what you expect for the Ising model and transverse field. The other thing that's, uh, that's remarkable about this is that there is any bandwidth at all for zero transverse field. 
So if you have an Ising model, if you have no transverse field, then you basically lose all of the quantum dynamics. Uh, if you have a spin flip or a domain wall, it just sits there. There's no way it can move. So what it looks like is that the field, the system, even at zero applied magnetic field, still has some kind of intrinsic transverse magnetic field that it's feeling that doesn't come from the external applied field. And this was a mystery. So there's some very nice work that uh, was done, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago, modeling cobalt niobate. And uh, it's, uh, it's a mystery in that data. You have very nice modeling of the zero field spectra, but there's just a phenomenological transverse field, which is assumed and, and not discussed. Um, you can, uh, you can, let's say, see other aspects of that. This is in this data here. Um, this is a plot at the top. That's the zero field data, both uh, below the transition, where you have all the sharp spectra, and then just slightly above it, where you have these very broad features. And above it, uh, so at low temperatures, when you have all the very sharp features, those are these confined domain walls. And we have slightly above the transition there, you just have these very, very long range ferromagnetic correlations and domain walls kind of running around free. But uh, again, when you make domain walls, you always have to make an even number of them. And so it leads to this broad continuum. We excite the system with, with zero momentum and uh, uh, can make a number of different, let's say K minus K pairs of domain walls there. And the domain, this broad continuum comes out as a result. Uh, you can also see in this data here, the, the data at the bottom is a plot of three Kelvin and 1.5 Kelvin with this susceptibility that's plotted out of the page. Regions of large susceptibility are, are there in black. And uh, for its, uh, we've applied the transverse magnetic field and we believe the critical point is around five and a half Tesla. And again, you can see here quite dramatically, there's this really very pronounced narrowing of the spectrum as you apply the transverse field. Okay. So, um, can show you some more data here, right? So that's uh, data at two and a half Kelvin. And uh, we had this data for a long time. And again, we're kind of confused about where it was coming from. But one thing was clear, it was a very robust effect. So you can take this data. This is a plot again of the susceptibility at zero field, plotted as a function of the transverse field, around five and a half Tesla is where you expect the transition to be. And so there's, again, this very, very pronounced narrowing of the spectrum. It doesn't look at all like the Ising model in transverse field. So that's two and a half Tesla, and then we can warm it up. And uh, you can see the spectrum kind of broaden and go away as you go to seven and a half, 10 Kelvin. Right? The, lots of the major features are preserved even up as high as 20 Kelvin where these correlations really develop for the first time. So that's kind of working, stepping through it and going to higher and higher temperatures. So, so this was a mystery to us. Now, I had had the idea for quite some time that uh, maybe there could be some feature, you know, some term allowed by symmetry that uh, that took advantage of the, the zigzag character of the chain. And then it kind of might make sense how you could get this narrowing, because if some of the bonds had an effective positive field mm. and some of the bonds had an effective negative field, then I apply, let's say, a positive field and the positive bonds get bigger and the negative bonds go back towards zero. And this would, you know, if, if that was the only thing going on, if you could tune the negative bonds to zero, then you would have some extraordinary field where you have domain walls that uh, you'd have these old, uh, let's say, dimers where everything would just be localized. And that would go back towards the direction of, of uh, uh, would go back in the direction of, uh, of uh, localized states and the bandwidth would narrow in that regard. But I couldn't, you know, the, my ideas, if you will, weren't much more uh, uh, developed than that. And and this is where this conversation with uh, with Reboot came in. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, it was the last talk I gave before the pandemic, and uh, he was my last meeting of the day when I was visiting University of Kentucky. He's moved on to Penn State since then, and uh, and really in about a half hour we had worked out the major details of it. On the left of this plot is cobalt niobate. That's the one, the zigzag chain. The uh, plot on the right, excuse me, is the hexagonal lattice that I showed you previously. And I want you to think about this hexagonal lattice as, uh, as uh, or let's say a 1D piece of the hexagonal lattice as the zigzag chain. And just as one might expect for the for the a system with strong spin orbit coupling, then as predicted for cobalt 3D7, has strong bond dependent interactions in um, materials that we'll talk about in the 2D case, we might expect the very same thing to exist in the case for cobalt, uh, cobalt niobate, where there is an Ising axis, but it flip-flops from positive to negative bond directions as you go down through the lattice. And um, 
you know, very often in physics, you know, you're kind of on the right track when there's a few things you don't understand and uh, you you kind of feel like you do understand them. And from that, you're able to predict a lot of things that you didn't even know needed to be understood before, but then but then are actually in the data. So um, <clears throat> just to give a, a little bit more of an idea about this. So what Ribu did was to write down a Hamiltonian, which is like the upper plot here, where there is a, a strong Ising interaction that um, is the, the only exchange interaction in the system, but where the Ising axis flip-flops from axis from direction N1 to direction N2 as you go down through the crystal. You can That's written in this local flip-flop axes, where the local axes, if you will, uh, alternate in direction back and forth, plus or minus theta between the different octahedra. You can also write it in uh, global xy coordinates in, in this fashion there, and that's just a simple variable transformation. Now, importantly in this, as you can see, when you write it in this fashion, you get this term, which looks like tau x tau z, right? So that's a, that's a spin operator here. And there's importantly this minus one to the i. i is uh, you know the, the, the index of, of what particular site in the crystal. And so this corresponds to a term which alternates sign as you go down through the crystal. Now, to get further insight into this, uh, you can uh, we can do a variety of different things. And one, one of the things that we did in our, in our paper, which appeared last year, was to work at a limit, which is almost the pure Ising axis, pure Ising system, but where this rotations between the plus or minus theta from bond to bond was very, very small. And in that case, you can kind of do it all within perturbation theory. And then you can see that the Hamiltonian gets this particular form here, where there's this minus one to the N, um, where it comes in a combination with the HX, which is the transverse field. And so that gives you the intuition that uh, that's that's that reflects the intuition that I had said previously, that if we apply the external field here, which is HX, and I, uh, that, well, let's say starting from, from zero field, some of the bonds have effective positive transverse field and some of them have effective negative transverse field. As I apply an external transverse field, some of the bonds get bigger, some of them get smaller. If this was the whole, if all of the physics was in this model, we would expect some extraordinary field where some of the exchange interactions would go to zero between sites as I tune the negative bonds to zero. And of course, there are other little subdominant terms as well. So, um, uh, with really just two free parameters, this was uh, this is our data at the top here from uh, uh, from the terahertz spectroscopy, and on the bottom is Nishita and uh, Ribu's calculation where they can fit all of the spectrum just on the basis of three three parameters. So a uh, Ising exchange, which is about 0.6 milliEV, uh, this angle theta, which is plus or minus 17 degrees, and a g factor of three and a half. Now, uh, one of the things that I had mentioned was that uh, very often in physics, you know you're on the right track when there are things that you now understand, can understand that you didn't know needed to be understood before. And in particular, one of the things that then we can understand is the nature of the high field spectrum. So when we take this system and we put a transverse magnetic field on it, the bond, the, the, the dispersions of the domain walls look like this plot up here, uh, plotting these dispersions along the top of the right there. And for zero magnetic field, the zero external magnetic field, the dispersions look like the far left plot there in red. You have these two domain wall dispersions and they're crossing each other at the center of the Berlin zone. You put a transverse field on it that lifts a glide plane symmetry. There's been also nice work the theoretical work done by Sid Paramesrawan and uh, Radu Koldea on this, and they emphasize the role of the glide symmetry. And that's one a way of thinking about this, that when you apply the transverse field, it removes this glide symmetry and opens up a gap at that point. As I said, when we do terahertz spectroscopy, we make two domain walls. And so now you realize that when you put the transverse field on the system, you have two bands of domain walls, and there are three possible ways of making two domain walls you can put two domain walls in the bottom band. Uh, and that gives uh, some, let's say on the right of this plot is this simple cartoon for what you would get then. You can put one domain wall in the bottom band and one domain wall in the top band. 
And uh, in the simplest picture, this just gives a completely non-dispersing continuum, but in our model actually has a little bit of, of, uh, of upward. There are other small terms that, that we're not accounting for, but certainly exist. Or you can put two domain walls in the upper band, and that's the features up here. So this is the kind of thing that, uh, that we didn't even know needed to be explained until we realized it and could see it in the model. Okay. Um, Maybe just very quickly now, I'll uh, I'll mention uh, this. Uh, there, uh, our paper um, uh, was in Nature Physics uh, last year. There's a very nice paper from uh, Leon Balentz and Radu Koldea and uh, collaborators and students, where they have gone and done DMRG and in a very similar fashion. Um, there with their numeric with their numerical calculations, emphasize the role of some bound states. In the system, and uh, uh, they they work out a particular perturbative scheme where they work in the limit where these bound states are localized, and then perturb away from there. And that's a very nice way of approaching this. This is not something that we emphasized in our paper. Um, we should have thought a little bit more about the bound states because this plot on the right here is supplemental information from our paper, where these bright yellow lines are actually the bound states that come out in uh, Nishita and Ribu's DMRG calculations, but we didn't comment on it at the time. Okay, so um, what I want to do with uh, with the remaining time now is bring it around full circle. And uh, what I hope I've done is convinced you that the 1D chain is uh, a reasonable place to look for for bond, strong bond dependent interactions. And indeed, I know of no way of describing the spectrum that, that I've shown you without assuming that you kind of have this internal field, which flips sign from site to site, which then points to this kind of strong bond dependent aspect and the cobalt chain, which has been predicted to have the bond dependent interactions that the hexagonal version of it may indeed realize some kind of kit of quantum spin liquid. So around the same time we were working on cobalt niobate, this 1D chain, we were also working on this material system here, barium cobalt 2 arsenic. And um, it was uh, it's a material which has uh, a history. There's neutron scattering data that goes back into the 90s. But in the modern era, there's this nice paper of Bob Kava and his postdoc Udon Zhang, who had reinvestigated and done say, from a modern context, looked at things like the phase diagram. This barium cobalt arsenic is cobalt oxide octahedra, edge sharing in the fashion that we've discussed in a number of different contexts with barium and arsenic in the planes nearby. And what was emphasized in their paper was, for instance, when you apply a in-plane magnetic field that uh, you take this system and you cool it down to low temperatures and around five and a half Kelvin, it goes into some kind of magnetically ordered state. But if you apply an in-plane field, you can suppress the magnetic order. You, you come down at zero or small magnetic field, you come into some kind of nominally anti-ferromagnetic-like state. And as you apply a field, you come through a variety of different kind of incommensurate and commensurate phases, which may have some kind of spin spiral structure and this kind of thing. But at really the quite small field of about a half a Tesla, you seem to suppress magnetic order altogether. Qualitatively, this phase diagram actually looks very, very similar to what goes on in alpha ruthenium chloride, with the exception that in alpha ruthenium chloride, all of these field scales are much larger. There's something like this transition to the non-magnetic state, or apparently non-magnetic state, happens something like seven or eight degrees Kelvin. And the scale that one would take to suppress the magnetic order can very roughly be traced back to the size of the non kitayev terms. And so it was quite reasonable that they inferred from this in this paper that barium cobalt arsenic may be a system with strong bond-dependent interactions of the kitayev variety, and at the same time, much smaller non kitayev terms, which could their role could be suppressed by applying the magnetic field. So this was the context in which we started working on the system. We were very excited by this because in addition to these uh, putative smaller non of interactions, th these are frankly just much better crystals than alpha ruthenium chloride. There's no stacking faults or twin domains that exist in this material system in contrast to things like alpha ruthenium chloride. Um, 
We can make very high crystals of them. We see almost all the phonons expected in the system and no extra ones that's in op normal infrared optics and in Raman scattering. And this is, for instance, in contrast to alpha ruthenium chloride, where uh, phonons related to disorder and stacking faults have been observed by, by Raman and, and IR. Okay, so, uh, so this was the context in which we were working on this. And uh, this is a plot of some of our data. So we did a variety of different experiments. Uh, we can take this system and we can cool it down at, say, zero magnetic field. And uh, that would be, a let's say, a cut in the phase diagram along the red axis there. And that corresponds to the data on the upper left. So this is a plot of the susceptibility as a function of frequency. And you can see that when you come from large and high temperatures, you get this very broad continuum behavior, which is quite uh, quite unusual by itself. Very often we have, when you're measuring magnetic systems at, at zero momentum, you when you cool such a system down, you basically have very, very little magnetic intensity. It's spread out, you know, just completely over the whole bandwidth of the system. And then when you hit the magnetic transition, you'll see well-defined magnetic modes. In contrast, this system where there is this uh, rather broad continuum behavior that kind of peaks up towards the lowest frequencies, and then as you cool down below the magnetic transition, you get these sharp, well-defined modes. This is rather uncharacteristic for the kind of thing you usually see in zero momentum susceptibility at finite frequency. You take the system <coughs> and apply a magnetic field to it in plane, and then you get this kind of characteristic behavior. We've done a variety of different experiments. We can apply the magnetic field both uh, along what's referred to as the B direction as well as the, as the so-called B star direction. And this is, if you will, what goes along the hexagonal bonds of the lattice or, or perpendicular to it. Uh, we can also play games with the applied, the direction of the terahertz magnetic field because there are different selection rules involved. And when we do this, we can see because of the different selection rules, different excitations. Again, kind of very interesting behavior as you kind of come through the different field ranges through a range of what is presumably some spin spiral behavior, some incommensurate magnetism, commensurate magnetism, then some funny region around half a uh, half a Tesla where it wasn't entirely clear what was going on, and then into a to a spin polarized regime. Um, we take this data as well, and we can take a look at it as a function of again the, the thing to emphasize with this. So one of the things to emphasize with this is just the very very small field scale that all this happens. Half a Tesla points to, uh, is is a small field scale to be able to suppress the magnetism. Now, uh, we can also take the data, uh, take these crystals, excuse me, and apply a large out-of-plane magnetic field. And then, let's say, at the lowest temperatures. And there, when you do this, you see something very interesting. So on the upper left here is a plot, susceptibility plotted out of, out of the page as a function of magnetic field. And you see this large, prominent peak at about 0.35 terahertz. And then just flunk here in the sample at around 4 tesla you just immediately go over to a very, very different behavior, which is a broad continuum behavior. In um, it, it, data like this, so again, very, very small field scale to get something like this in alpha ruthenium chloride, you have to go up to something like of order uh, 80 Tesla. Uh, that's believed to be the field scale that you need to suppress the magnetism in the system. The um, uh, field scales here are much, much smaller. I should say that in the data that I'm showing here at the, at the top, where the, it looks like this excitations are suppressed around three and a half or four Tesla, it was very likely the case that we had very, very small in-plane field as well, right? That there's a small canting. Um, this system is, is very... Uh, has very strong in-plane anisotropy. So the easy axis is in-plane. And so there's likely like, likely mixed character in, in this terahertz data. We did some work with magnetization with uh, uh, Tom Halloran had worked done some work on the magnetization as a function of magnetic field, found it's very, very difficult to apply a purely C-axis or Z-axis magnetic field in the system. Um, and when uh, a, a more careful job could be done in the system that could be done in our um, in our terahertz cryostat that one found that the field scale was maybe as large as 10 Tesla, where the magnetization, uh, the, the um, magnetic susceptibility was showing features and one can infer the phase transition from it. 10 or 11 Tesla was somewhere where this transition was, but at any rate, far below the field scale of, uh, of something similar in alpha ruthenium chloride. 
So uh, data like this, um, uh, we thought that this was quite interesting and uh, didn't believe, uh, still don't think that this is likely to explain this data through features of, or let's say through interpretations where this dramatic and quite unusual continuum is arising from overdamped magnons in such a system as, as you, generically you would expect magnon damping would be uh, would be expected to strongly decrease at the higher fields where uh, magnons and multi-particle continua overlap less. And so our interpretation was that this was a it was an interesting continuum. Our our first thoughts were indeed that this was all consistent with this being a Kitaev magnet and uh, being able to suppress the magnetic order in a fashion that has uh, um, uh, been inferred to be the case in alpha ruthenium chloride. But here we could do it without a plane field. So around the same time we were working on that, there was uh, there was a lot of other work that had come out and uh, that said, let's say. Uh, uh, was skeptical around this kind of perspective on the system. A number of different theory papers, various ab initio calculations, um, some addressing the 3D7 cobalts in general, some in particular looking at barium cobalt arsenic. Those are the first three, the first three plots at the top here. Um, also very nice work from my uh, colleague Colin Broholm and, and his student uh, Tom Halloran. And I believe Colin gave a talk at this series a few weeks ago, and their conclusion from their neutron scattering work, where they can see out to higher momentum and get a get a more comprehensive look to see what's going on with the uh, momentum dependence of various excitations, is that, as is highlighted here, they conclude, we show that the existing experimental data can be consistently accounted for by an XXZ J1, J3 model, but not by JK gamma gamma prime and discuss the implications for the realization of spin liquid phase in BCAO. So uh, what they had done was compare the totality of their data to a model, which was essentially a modified Kitaev, so-called JK gamma gamma prime, and what was essentially an anisotropic Heisenberg Magnus, but with next nearest neighbor, uh, next next nearest neighbor, J3 exchange model. Um, this is a very nice paper. I think that, uh, in my opinion, the jury is still out. One of the most significant parts of uh, their modeling is the existence of the J3 term. And in particular, the ordered state which they get, uh, you cannot get that ordered state without this high order J3 term. So you can't select the right ground state without J3. And since it's a calculation which compares uh, no J3 to a calculation with J3, then I think really the right calculation to, to look at this in more detail is the JK gamma gamma prime, but with a J3, since J3 is really one of the most important things. But but nevertheless, I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, these theoretical calculations and uh, when you look at some more subtle aspects of the magnetization data, it uh, it does raise questions about whether or not there could be bond dependent interactions in this system and whether they are or are not like cobalt niobate, where I think we've shown quite definitively that they exist. And so if they don't exist in a material like barium cobalt arsenic, then I think you need to ask yourself, uh, why not? You know, if you will, um, if something has gone wrong in barium cobalt arsenic, what was it that went right in cobalt niobate? And I think at this time, it's really not clear. I encourage, uh, I've been encouraging uh, theorists and in particular people who are inclined to doing ab initio calculations to take a good hard look at cobalt niobate and uh, try to understand what's going on from an ab initio perspective with the exchange interactions there. Um, it has been proposed that one of the big problems with barium cobalt arsenic is that this system has a so-called trigonal distortion, right? That, uh, barium cobalt arsenic has these tetrahedra, excuse me, octahedra, but it is elongated in the case of barium cobalt arsenic. And if that trigonal distortion, that elongation is large enough, that potentially can quench the orbital degrees of freedom, which are necessary for having the bond dependent interactions. And about this, I would just say, I don't think that there's any evidence at all. There is a distortion in this system, but I don't think there's any evidence at all that that distortion is large enough in barium cobalt arsenic that it can do this. So even the most, um, if you will, uh, pessimistic or optimistic, depending on your perspective, uh, even if the, the the estimates for the largest 
trigonal distortion that we might think is consistent with the data, say G tensors or crystal field excitations, put barium carbon arsenic somewhere about here, the blue dashed line in this plot, uh, where the ratio of the crystal field energies over the spin orbit coupling is something about one or two. And this is still in a regime where kit-type interactions dominate. Cobalt niobate is, if you will, under it. the cobalt niobate, the 1D chain is, uh, it, it, it also has a crystal structure which deviates from the ideal octahedra. It is trigonally distorted, but it's also squashed from the side, if you will. And so that's a rather low symmetry situation, but we can just very, very roughly get out some feeling about the energy scales from the anisotropy of G tensors. And if we want to put it on the same plot, it's about there in this plot, right? So just a little bit, a little bit on the compressed side. And so if I have to ask, you know, why, uh, what has gone wrong in barium cobalt arsenic and right in cobalt niobate, my most honest answer is I don't know. But what I expect is the reason, and this was where ab initio calculations would make a big difference, is that it's actually an effect of the direct exchange, that the direct exchange is much larger in the multiply connected 2D lattice of barium cobalt arsenic. And in particular, the role of the barium and the arsenic sites, I think, needs to be investigated. In, uh, in this regard, the thing that we're looking for, though, is direct metal-metal in our uh, hopping, and uh, and uh, that's presumably larger in the barium cobalt arsenic case. And direct exchange is giving this exchange interaction, let's say, with a larger Heisenberg, which is ultimately, you know, uh, pushing this thing away from uh, where we'd expect that is well described by by bond dependent interactions. Um, I think that this is really ripe for, for, for future theory, and, and I hope people look at it. So that's all that I wanted to say. I hope that I have uh, uh, convinced you that there's a lot of interesting things going on here. I talked about cobalt niobate, this material which was uh, believed to be the best material realization of, uh, of Easing's model. And it is that, but it's also more than that. You know, It's a source of... Uh, certainly it is uh, the quantum phase transition is in the Easing universality class. But uh, there's other interesting physics there as well. And uh, I, I talked a little bit about uh, the kramers vanier duality, this universal factor of two uh, that is uh, an essential element of, of uh, criticality in this, uh, in, that, in this universality class. But one of the things that came out of this was the realization that there's strong bond-dependent interactions in a, in a way very similar to that predicted by Sato and Lu and Kululin. Um, there's some interesting physics there by itself. I talked a little bit about the Sushu for Heger model, and then I brought it back around to Kitayev and asked, uh, maybe we could see similar bond-dependent interactions in barium cobalt arsenic. I think that uh, there is a lot of interesting physics to do in barium cobalt arsenic. It is uh, uncertain, in fact, if the exchange interactions are bond-dependent, but I think that there's some evidence at reasonably small fields that, the, at least spectroscopically, that uh, an out-of-plane field of only of a few Tesla can may induce a state, which is a quantum spin liquid. And so I would encourage people to look at this system, particularly in that regime of out-of-plane field by the various experiments they can. And then to bring it all together, um, we may want to, if we if we think that the system is a quantum spin liquid, barium cobalt arsenic, but not for kit of reasons, then we might want to uh, ask ourselves, uh, and, and it doesn't have large bond-dependent interactions, ask ourselves what's special about cobalt niobate in this regard that it does. And uh, that might be a, a clue or a key to us to designing new materials, which uh, uh, can realize uh, 2D hexagonal lattices with, uh, with uh, which are closer to the kit I implement. So that's all I have to say. And uh, yes. anyway, thank, thank you for you. your attention. And I'm happy to take, uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, very nice talk. Yeah. So let me, let me sort of, uh... As the host uh, tried to ask you the first, so so what is the key difference then? You know, in the in your in your uh, barium cobalt arsenic uh, oxygen stuff, uh, the, you, you can apply field in the plane and out of the plane. I mean, how do you? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, why, why 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 would you emphasize that the out of plane field induces a quantum spin liquid? I mean, the uh, field, well, I mean, in both cases, suppresses the order, right? In both cases, well, if I, I'm cool, uh, in both cases, they order, what do you mean? In I mean, zero they get already suppressed, right? I mean, the, the implant field, you know, you need like half a Tesla. I mean, That's in right. fact, you know, thermal conductivity measurement shows that when you induce a half a Tesla field, you know, you certainly have a finite, you know, intersection of the thermal conductivity, you know, close to zero. 
and yeah. the question, I mean, by, by you trying to emphasize that, that you know, with all the plant field, you know, you, yeah. you actually induce it. So, you know, I'm just curious, uh, to, to what is the key difference? Yeah. So, so the different, the key difference is that uh, basically what do we see in the case for, um, uh, okay, so, so, so the nature of the spectrum are a little different and I didn't emphasize this much, but when, so look at the plot on the, the lower left here in blue. Okay. okay. That's applying the in-plane, that's applying an in-plane field. Okay. And when I do that, I get, uh, I go from this um, broad continuum. Sorry, uh, I don't actually have the plot. Where's the plot that I wanted to show? Uh, maybe, uh, I don't have the one I wanted to show. Okay, but anyway, you can, maybe you can see it here. This is this is better actually. Yeah, so so this is um, this is a plot of susceptibility for two different directions of the terror field field mm -hmm. applied. And what you can see at, at any rate, you see in the ordered state some sharp features. And right. when you come out of the ordered state, you see other sharp features. And so it looks like that, at least by the time you hit one Tesla, at least from our spectroscopic information, that we're seeing sharp features which are consistent with coming into some kind of field polarized regime. Oh, so what you're saying is that in the, in the implant field, you immediately, you know, flip into a simple viral magnet. Yeah. So I don't know what happens in the kind of, there's a, if you look at uh, in this plot here, there's uh, on the lower left, there's a difference between BC2 and BC2 star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is some possibility that there's something small and interesting happening in that regime right there. Um, we had kind of wiki data for that, that it seems like there's a continuous evolution of the features there. But certainly, once you get above this, you know, 0.6 Tesla, and then on sure. up, sure. you're in a field, you're in a regime which looks like it's field polarized. There's sharp features in the spectrum that um, seem to be consistent with this being in a field polarized state. And that's different from this, where when you put a field on it, you go into a regime where it's not field polarized. It's I not, it's not field polarized. You get a broad continuum. I see, but but they're both. I mean, coming out of a of a simple order state, right? I mean, you know, the reason it has ordering is because you have some sort of a gap that I yep. mean, that the the column sees, right? As some sort of a finite wave vector, you would expect, you know, when you apply these fields, that the, the gap will actually close, right? As you gradually, you know, approaching the uh, critical field. So, so what yeah. you're saying is that uh, you know, depending on the field direction, and the outcome of the states is actually different. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you can see here, for instance, that, uh, I mean, uh, you might also recall from Colin's data is that they don't see any particular features at the ordering wave vector, right? There's no, um, you know, they, they apply some fields, they see clearly new features uh, as a function of field, but it doesn't look like there's any mode which is softening at the ordering wave vector. Right. Uh, that might be consistent with there being, you know, some kind of very abrupt transition, and that's consistent with our data here, where at something like point three terahertz, you see the strong feature, and then blunk at three and a half for Tesla, you just come into a different regime altogether. I see. Do, do you know Do you know the uh, the field polarized state then for, for the C-axis aligned field? No, it hasn't been, hasn't, been, hasn't been looked at. Okay. okay. Yeah, so no, so that needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, it has to be analyzed. I think people have the data, but it hasn't been, uh, there's no published data on that. Okay. Yeah, so so there's there's a bunch of different things I think that should be done still with the neutron scattering, and those things are ongoing. One is uh, detailed neutron scattering investigations for primarily out of plane field, but in this regime of four or five, six, seven Tesla, something like that. Yeah, but that, that's right? very so difficult. That, but that's very difficult because once you put out of plane field, then you cannot access the the magnetic black heat and the spin waves. I mean, you you basically yeah. sort of screwed. I mean, in a way, yeah. Unfortunately, your scattering plane is you have you can you know apply mixed field, yeah, so it's right. pure R plane. Well, and, and so and so and in fact, mixed field is uh, is probably what you want because uh, you know as I as I show here when we or rather when Tom went and really tried to keep it purely along the the, the field along the C direction. Oh, it's going to be much field, larger, right? Mm -hmm. The field is much larger, yeah. So the, mm -hmm. the susceptibilities are a factor very roughly at low temperature, something like fifty different between C axis and, and in plane. And so, you know, this is a system which is really hard to do experiments on with a C axis oriented field. Right. So probably you always are gonna have mixed mixed character. And I think that's the difference between, let's say the data at the bottom of this plot and the data at the top of this plot on the left, 
we saw this transition happening at three and a half or four Tesla, whereas in the data at the bottom, it's 10. And that's just because, you know, just a few percent of in plane field can drive this thing. So, you know, what, what I think, you know, it was, is interesting to see how, presumably for large enough out of plane field, you come into a polarized regime, obviously. I mean, that, that seems clear. And so it would be clear if there's an interesting field, intermediate field regime, it's interesting to see how does that field regime shrink as the field is turned into the in-plane axis. So you basically want to sort of angular dependence of uh, sort of yeah. the, uh, the, the the magnetization versus the field right. to see. Yeah. So yep. what is the angle you expect based on your data, based on the data shown yeah. here? Can you estimate? Well, no, I mean, we 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 didn't we couldn't estimate it. It's not more than a few percent, even in in the data. Okay. Right, right. I mean, this is I, this is some new information that I did not get. You know, from from Colin's talk here. Yeah. This is yeah. very nice. The Colin does not have this so, information. Yeah. Yeah, so so the the um, I think it's important to look at uh, uh, c-axis or primarily c-axis oriented field. That's what I just said. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think it's important to do the same investigation, of, you know, of a similar variety that Colin had done, and they've done a very nice job so far. But but where it is uh, essentially Kitai of sized parameters, but with J three. Yeah, that's so actually surprising that's, that's, because it's the insulator, right? Typically, insulator there's no arc KY. I mean. Such a large distance exchange interaction, you know, induced. I mean, he's saying induced order is kind of a surprising, right? In a way, yeah. Well, it's. I mean, they're three D, right? So they're not. Uh, um, it's uh, in this. I mean, it's, it's not a small. It's three D, so it's not. It's excuse me. What I, what I meant to say was, it's three D, and it's not a very large term. I don't remember how big they found, mm -hmm. but um, you basically can't get the ordering vector without it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so that's that's yeah. quite important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other key uh, other key bit of data is the magnetization. So the magnetization data looks very similar for let's say B and B star directions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, that's something you also get with J three, and you really kind of need that to to have that. Okay. Okay. And so. I think it's. Uh, I, I, I think they've done a really. I mean, they've done the best job that anybody's done. No, they've done, done a very nice job. Mm -hmm. But I, I think they need to. One of the really essential. So it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison in their in their modeling because it's it's kind of Kitayev esque parameters with no J J three, and then Heisenberg parameters with the J three, right. and um, and then J three is really important. Yeah, Yang Bai, Yang Bai Kim. Yeah, did a lot of the analysis for them. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, any other question for for Peter? Yeah, can I ask a question, Peter? Yeah, yeah, please. Hi, Rondo, how are you? Yeah, yeah, hi, how are you? So uh, here in this terahertz data you're showing, how do you tell that this you have this sort of like one over frequency type behavior as opposed to just the tail of a lower frequency peak, like a lower frequency oh. magnon? Yeah, so... Um... It could be so. Yeah, I don't have the plot right here and ready to show you right now. So we've uh, so this data, as you well know, uh, this chi double prime has to turn over at the lowest frequencies, and so um, it's got to go to. It basically can't keep going up like this, and right. And there's a there's a there's some rules. Uh, one of the one of the and again, you know this, but just repeating it for everyone. The uh, one of the real advantages of terahertz data is that we measure the complex susceptibility, the real and imaginary parts, and these have a kramers koenig relation between them. And the advantage of that is that you can learn about aspects of the data, even for parts of the spectrum that you haven't measured. And so the canonical case of this kind of thing is for a superconductor, where that's in the conductivity, where you want to know how much, if you will, conductivity spectral weight is in the delta function, but that's at zero frequency and you can't measure that. So you measure one over omega dependence at finite frequency and you measure the coefficient. So you measure the imaginary part to learn about the real part. And we, we can essentially do something, so we do something very similar here as well, that we can we measure the real parts and the imaginary part. Here, I'm just showing the imaginary part. And together we can come up with a model that basically allows us with knowing the DC values as well, that allows us to constrain the spectral weight. And, um, this in order to get this to to basically uh, you know to have the, the amount of spectral weight work out and to have the the um, uh, the imaginary part be cons the measured imaginary part be consistent with the measured real part 
uh, this has to be a very broad peak, which pers persists down to, to very low frequencies. I mean, it could be some kind of magnon that we couldn't, uh, that, if you will, is peaked at 0.1 terahertz or, or you know, 0.05 terahertz, something very, very low. But, uh, but there's no reason, I think, to, to expect that in a system with anisotropies like this, that you, that you would get that. Okay. Uh, 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 oh, you yeah. had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Peter. Thank you for the nice talk. So uh, I have a question. For, so for the in-plane case, can one think of the intermediate uh, region as some kind of 1D-like latitude liquid? Because you see the, the, the bonds, the only those bonds perpendicular to the field really play a role, right? So the question is, um, can I think of it as, as being one D with the in, with for various directions for the in plane field? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. I mean, um... because you, uh, along the field, uh, the, those bonds along, like I mean. Uh, parallel to the field is kind of um, don't, uh, don't have a like a contribution because of the the strong field exists. Um, let me think for a second here. Uh, yeah, I mean whether that's consistent. So you know, I I don't think that's inconsistent with our data, but uh, but I have to think about whether it's consistent with mm -hmm. the with the totality of the data. I think it's probably not consistent with um, with the neutron scattering, where they can see the dispersions, you know, both along okay. the yeah. direction yeah. particular to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this system is actually very, very interesting. I think even much to be done, you know, still many things to be done Yeah, on the system. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other question for Peter? There were some, some things in the chat, but I wasn't monitoring. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, there, one, one of the chat I sent you was to how to use the pointer. <laughs> Sorry oh. about that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's too late, yeah. Too yeah. late. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, thank Peter. You. Yeah, okay, good. All right, thanks, everyone. And yeah. uh, bye -bye. thanks. Thanks for organizing these pinching. It's nice. Yeah. Very good. Very good resource. Yeah. Bye. Take care.